good morning, everyone. Welcome to this session. Thanks for coming along. Um, my name is Matt Summers from Matt Summers Coaching Skills Training, and I'll say a little bit more about me and my background uh, as uh, the, the session progresses. But what I'd like to do straight away is um, try and get you thinking. So uh, I devised a little poll uh, just to get the old grey matter stimulated before we get into the detail. Hopefully this appears on your screen now. And it asks, what percentage of your team's potential shows up at work? In other words, of all of your team members' potential, what they might be able to do, how much of that do you feel shows up and manifests at the workplace? So I'll just give you uh, a few seconds just to have a think about that, and then we'll discuss it. Meantime, uh, Kirsty, perhaps you could start the slideshow for me. Hopefully now we've had a few gremlins again this morning, but I'm hoping everybody can see uh, a big slide and a little me, um, which would be better than a big me and a little slide. I'll just give you a... Hi, Matt. Sorry. Yes. yes, we can. We can see you. And the, uh, Great. Thank you. Good. OK. So I'm seeing the little bar on the poll results. Uh, moving back and forth, which is which is quite interesting. There's no votes at all in the the naught to twenty four, which is good. Slaps on the back all round. No votes either in the seventy five to hundred. So um, it seems the vast majority of people feel that the answer to this question is is fifty to seventy four percent, which is I think quite typical. I've asked this question of seminar and webinar audiences a number of times, and it usually hovers in about that that range. Um, which is quite interesting because even at its best, if it's sort of 74, 75 percent, there's still an instinct that there's there's more to go at, that there's more of people's potential that somehow we're not getting access to uh, in, in the workplace. And it can be quite interesting if I ask a follow up question. Well, well, how do you know? Um, people often say things like, well, I think of the guy who works in our account session and in our account section. He does all kinds of incredible things outside of work. He volunteers for this, that and the other. But somehow seems to not be able to bring that to bear at work. And I think there are lots of uh, examples like that, which suggest that we need something like coaching. You know, there's 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 talent that is going to waste. There's talent that's being held back. Can we use coaching to, to liberate that? And um, the reason I asked you to get started thinking about that at the start of this session is it, it forms something of a, of a theme as, as we'll go through. So um, my name's Matt. This is a quick start guide to coaching for leaders. Uh, Kirsty, if we could have the next slide, please. And uh, I'd like to start by sharing some of the things that, that I did uh, during lockdown. Like many of you, I suppose, in late March, um, my calendar became like the clapperboard at King's Cross Station when you're coming back to the northeast where there's uh, train cancellations, everything kind of disappeared. And like a lot of people, I had to think about um, what I was going to do with my time. And I decided it'd be really useful to to try and understand what my typical client, my prospective client, the, the leaders that I'd been working with uh, were experiencing. And um, there were some common threads. Uh, and first amongst those was perhaps that um, all of a sudden, their knowledge and their expertise and their experience had almost overnight become redundant. Um, the world after March 20 was immediately starting to look very different to everything really we'd experienced up to that point. Leaders I was finding were finding that very unsettling, that their knowledge, their expertise appeared to be of no use going forward. So that was a concern. Similarly, um, their teams were no longer within easy reach. They weren't able to open a door and just talk to people. Everybody now was, was, was scattered around working from home. And related to that was a, a third uh, anxiety, which was to do with communicating in the way that you and I are doing here this morning, virtually from our homes, using all sorts of, of strange equipment, which was having a lot of impact on the kind of the quality of communication. So I decided um, uh, to deal with something that I'd recognized for some time, which are, is that coaching was going to provide the communication style um, 
that was going to be able to deal with that and solve a lot of those problems. But the irony was that leaders were now had no time or budget to get trained in coaching. So at a time when it was most needed was a time when they were least able to access it or, or develop their skills in that area. So, uh, Kirsty, I don't know if you can advance the, the next click, please. There's just a couple of images on this slide. Hi, sorry, uh, Marsha. We're just having a couple of issues at the moment with the slides. Um, okay. so currently, um, sorry, everybody, I know that there's a few people mentioned it in the forum. We're dealing with that right now. So um, we're just uh, going to leave your, your lovely face on there, Matt, to continue on. Wow. Thank you. Okay. All right, no problem. So um, as we shall, we'll, we'll see when we solve the, uh, the slide gremlins, um, I set to writing a guide, which I called the Quick Start Guide to Coaching for Leaders. And what I wanted to accomplish there was to remove some of the, the mystique, I suppose. Um, I'd, for example, always done some fairly um, heavy uh, coaching skills training. I would work with people typically for two days or more in a face-to-face -face workshop. Um, doing a lot of groundwork, doing a lot of the theoretical background, and then uh, in the end, of course, developing some actual hands-on skills. But um, people I, I knew needed a shortcut. And it just so happened that at the time I was thinking all this through, I, I took delivery uh, of a new printer. And as I was unpacking the printer, at the top of the box was one of these quick start guides. So you know how you get a big fat manual but you also get like a laminated sheet that just enables you to cut to the chase. This is what gave me the idea of a quick start guide to coaching, which I, I then wrote and I've been sort of spraying around uh, ever since. And within that guide, I kind of boiled down the coaching approach, particularly a questioning approach to coaching, to being about five key questions. And the idea being that you didn't have to have coaching expertise, but if you employed these, these five questions, you could be having a coaching style conversation and you could do that virtually and you could do it with, with, with just a, a, in just a few minutes. So those five questions were, what do you want in relation to a particular issue or a situation that somebody was, was dealing with? What's happening with that now? How big is the gap between what you want uh, and, and where you start from? What could you do? which is about generating options, and then what, what will you do, which is plotting some action points or a way forward. And uh, in this, uh, this session, I want to get into some of the detail of that a little bit more and perhaps try and convey what it is that happens uh, when we ask those questions, how they generate the effect that they do. But uh, one of the things that I wanted to, to talk about today uh, and one of the reasons that I asked everyone to have a think about the nature of potential is because this presents us with a useful starting point for uh, a coaching approach. Um, there's a concept that uh, a lot of us in coaching use uh, called the coaching equation. This comes from the work of a guy called uh, Tim Galway. Some of you might know that name if you've uh, looked into coaching before. Um, Tim Galway, for many of us, is considered to be uh, the godfather of, of coaching, the originator of a lot of these ideas. Um, he was very influential to people like uh, Sir John Whitmore and Miles Downey, prominent kind of UK coaches. And Galway, by uh, profession, was a, um, an educationalist. He, he was a lecturer at, at Harvard and I think other Ivy League uh, universities in the States. Um, but being Californian, he also fit the stereotype and was a very, very accomplished tennis player and also quite an accomplished uh, tennis coach. And one time he took a sabbatical from um, his work and decided to spend a year concentrating on his tennis coaching and his work with a, a country club and discovered an interesting thing. And what he discovered was that it was as he got out of his students' way and stopped burdening them with quite so much instruction, that ironically, it was those students' um, performance that would increase uh, most rapidly. And this, you can imagine, kind of um, threw a lot of the accepted wisdom about the, the nature of coaching and things on its head. And I can see that my slide deck has appeared again. So I'm going to go back to... Um, what I was planning on talking about and lead up again to, to Galway. I'll, I'll tell you some more about him 
uh, when we get to the appropriate point in the slide. So this is all about uh, the, the, the nature of potential. Um, and again, I don't know if we can do this in the discussion forum. Let's just see, or the live Q&A. Let me um, see if we can flag another question. And this follows on from the one that uh, we, we started with. But this time, my question to you is, is a person's potential limited or limitless? Could you have a think about that for me, please? Hopefully you can you can hear me. You can put a, an answer to this somewhere. Is a, a person's potential limited or limitless? A couple of votes coming through. Amanda, thank you. Limitless, you say. Jenny, limitless. Oh, we've got some positive people here. Lynn, Deborah, Natalia, limitless, limitless, limitless. Okay. Anyone going to put their head above the parapet and vote for limited. <laughs> Depends. Yep, you could be right there, Emma. So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 again, I can see here uh, I'm getting answers that, that are typical. Um, a lot of people um, view potential as, as perhaps limited, you know, it's going to depend on environmental factors and, and, and what's happened to a person before. Uh, others uh, argue for limitless. That's probably the more popular view. Um, and it becomes, I suppose, quite interesting to think about, well, again, how, how do we know? And people will often say, well, you know, you look at these kind of world records in sport and so on that are in place for years and years and years, and people claim that they'll never be never be beaten, never be exceeded. And then somebody comes along and, and does that and, and sets the bar. Um, who knows? You know, we, we can't prove these things one way or another. We'll get to the end of time before there'll be some grand reckoning and human potential will have been proven or, or, or disproved. And so we're left then as people who take uh, a coaching approach with having to um, to make a choice. And my starting point really for anyone who wants to uh, to get good at coaching and get good quickly is we have to make that positive choice. You know, we don't know whether potential might be limited or limitless, but we might assume it to be limitless because that probably opens more possibilities and it's going to help us avoid any sense of, uh, of there being a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, if I could have the next slide, please, if it's working now. Great. So hopefully you're seeing a slide now that suggests that potential should equal performance. And I guess our job as leaders is to make that so. Right. You know, our, our job, what we're paid to do if we're if we're leading people, of course, is to take that potential and convert that into high performance. You know, whether that's kind of sales generated or customers served or, or, or whatever it might be. And ideally, that should hold true. But uh, if we look at the next slide. Unfortunately, the reality is that there's there's often a gap that between my potential, what I might be able to do and what I actually do, there's there's a gap. The two don't marry up. And if we think of um, sort of orthodox uh, learning and development, the idea there is that we try to fill the gap. We add to it. And that makes sense when oops, that's perhaps one too many for me. If we could go back one. Two. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and that makes sense if the if the gap can be explained on, on, on a matter of, of skill or knowledge. So if I if my job is to produce some software for you and I don't do that particularly well because I don't understand the software thoroughly enough. Well, you've got a relatively straightforward uh, performance problem to address. Get me some training. Let me work through something online. Other things being equal. I get that knowledge that I need and I'm away. But what if the problem is different? You know, what if it's not a lack of knowledge and skills? What if it's to do with with fatigue or anxiety or boredom? You know, what if I used to produce great spreadsheets in the past, but now mistakes are creeping in? You know, this is not going to be solved by exposing me to more training because that's not the issue. What we have to recognize there is that um, the nature of the gap is different and it requires a different uh, approach. We could see the next slide, please. So here's how the equation begins to look, that between my potential, what I might be able to do, my performance, 
what I go on to achieve, there lies interference. And if we move on to the next slide, please. I sound like Chris Whitty at the, at the evening briefing. Um, we might usefully classify uh, these interferences as to, to one of two types. So on the one hand, there's what we might think of as external interference. These are the sorts of things that go on around people as they're trying to do their thing. And you can see on my slide there, I've listed some of the typical ones. Um, and it's interesting to me that one of the most popular answers to that question when I ask it of groups is, what's the typical source of external interference? And they'll say poor leadership, poor management. And the irony of this is not lost on me, you know, that we, the very people that are there to get the best out of people, are often seen as the ones that most get in the way. So there's a, a powerful argument for a different approach already. Probably more of interest, I guess, where the low hanging fruit might lie to those of us interested in this sort of approach is on the right hand side, on the internal, trying too hard, negative thoughts, negative expectations, negative memories, remembering things that have happened in the past that didn't go well and those sorts of things uh, preying on our mind now. Uh, we can find that those sorts of things really are quite, quite sinister. Uh, and if we could go back, please, one side to the, the, the equation one, Number six. This kind of proves proves the point here. We remember we're saying that it's it's our potential. What we might be able to do doesn't equal high performance. It is is not giving us the performance we want because of this stuff that gets in the way. And I put it to you that if you think of times in your own career where you've performed at your best, I'm guessing that would be times when you've been able to work free from interference. So most people have some kind of recollection. Some experience to draw on of, of knowing what that's like but it's fleeting it's it's ephemeral we it seems to be a, a matter of luck well what i hope to demonstrate or give you a, a flavor of in uh, the time that remains is it's not down to luck we can use coaching techniques to try and address this idea of interference if we could jump forward two slides please And the next one, yeah. So I just want to round this off. This is what I was uh, speaking about earlier on when we were sorting out the slides. This is draws on the work of a chap called Tim Galway. Um, wrote a, a, a book in the 1970s, which proved to be a seminal work for anybody interested in coaching called The Inner Game of Tennis. And if any of you listening to this are uh, involved in sort of children's sport or something like that in, in a coaching role, I would really, really recommend getting hold of uh, of this book. Please don't be put off by the tennis of the title. Um, that's really irrelevant. It's it's more to do with getting on top of these interferences, you know, the mental side of any endeavor. Galway in the book um, it came up with a quote that really forms the backdrop to my coaching work, has influenced a lot of others, and I think is absolutely fascinating. And he said, it's the opponent in one's own head is more formidable than the one on the other side of the net. And I think if you look at top level tennis, top level sport, you can see that that's true. You know, you'll have two people playing who are absolute masters technically, who have levels of fitness that are almost unbelievable. So what makes the difference on the day will be the, uh, the what's going on in their head, you know, the voices that they're, they're sort of listening to and so on. And if that's the case in sport, if there are these inner games that we play, then it's my experience as well that there are these same inner, inner games in business or very similar ones. There's an inner game of selling, without a doubt. There's an inner game of leading people. There's an inner game of customer relations and so on and so on and so on, where we find that, that the same thing happens. It's what's going on in people's heads is often more of a barrier, more of an obstacle to them performing and accessing their potential um, than, than anything that's going on around them. So let's have a little think about what we, what we might be able to do uh, about some of that. If I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. So the antidote to this interference is to keep our mind busy with more productive things. We might call that enabling people to find their focus. Um, but there's a few uh, kind of watchwords that I need to share with you there. F firstly, that focus, when we talk about focus, talk about achieving results through focus. This is not the same as trying really hard. One great, great way of uh, 
trying to improve performance in any endeavor is through gargantuan effort, you know, through process of trying really, really hard, straining every sinew or the, the mental equivalent, which becomes working all hours and taking work home and never taking a break or a holiday. But this is unsustainable over time, you know, so achieving results through focus is rather different. It is effortless rather than effortful. Second thing we have to recognize is it's very difficult to command or direct people to be focused on certain things. You know, however strong a business objective they might be, it happens that people's focus follows more what they're interested in. So we have to try and tie those two things together. And significantly, um, uh, focus, as we'll see, is promoted through questions, not through instructions. Right. Which is where we get into a, a questioning style of coaching. So. Um, as we move to the next slide, um, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to, to to show you a video. I'll just sort of talk about that for uh, a few seconds while the guys uh, tee it up a little bit. So this goes back some years to um, when I was running some um, face to face coaching skills training. We used to use a venue called Longhurst Hall up in Morpeth, which uh, some of you might know uh, or remember it's it's not there anymore. It's been converted into houses, sadly. But uh, I would be there every couple of months running these these sessions. And um, with this particular guy, we'll, we'll call him Colin. Um, he was one of my all time favorite delegates because he and I got into a little bit of a fight around this idea that as a coach, you 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 don't need expertise that you don't have to be the one with more wisdom, that you don't have to be a better player uh, than the people whom you're coaching. And Colin was having a bit of a problem with this idea. And he said to me, I've just taken up golf, for example. I surely need some kind of golf expert to show me how to ha hold the club and particularly where to hit the ball and so on and so forth. How could a, how could a coach, if that person didn't have golfing expertise, possibly help me? Now, this, unbeknownst to him, was a bit of a gift to me because it happens that I've often used the swinging of a club at a golf ball as a bit of a coaching demonstration. So hopefully now we're ready to queue up uh, the video with, with Colin and I doing some work on his golf swing and uh, we'll see what happens and, and let me know any thoughts or comments in the chat. Really hope you can hear it as well. Um is to forget about this being an exercise in golf and not to worry about what happens with the ball because once your club has made contact with the ball that's when you're left the gods so when you were saying yesterday i swear i wouldn't wouldn't even be out of here that that's what we can solve so what the mindset i want you to get into Collins, this is an exercise in you and i working together in finding an appropriate focus so you know how like when you're on the skis earlier on it suddenly clicked with people that the appropriate focus was the rhythm. Our job, you and I now, is to find an appropriate focus for you. And then just get you home and in on that. Okay? So I'll put the ball on the map. You just have a whack and we'll see what happens. Okay, again. Right. So you, you, you've got a feel for making the swing. What I'm going to ask you now um, is, is to articulate an aim for me. So, given that we've only got a few minutes to kind of do some work on this, yep. what would what would represent success? What's a useful aim? To be able to hit it. So it's like a consistency thing, is it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Take another swing at it then, and this time all I want you to do, what I want you to concentrate on, is to afterwards be able to tell me what you're most aware of during the whole action. Okay. Whereabouts on the ball were you looking? Not the top. Right on the top. Okay, can you take another swing and um, see if you can hit it in exactly the same spot? Where, where did that? That was at the top. Okay, precisely the same spot again, please. Trying to hit the top. Okay. If it was a clock face, Colin, if the front of the ball where the club head makes contact with it was a clock face, where where would you be hitting? I mean, 12, 3, 9, 6? No, probably about 3. About 3. So can you show me a, what 3 o'clock would look like? <laughs> 12. 
any questions? No. Good. <laughs> Wanna have a go? <laughs> go for it guys, pick up some yeah. pick up some sticks and uh, some bowls and things and a bit like our ball catching yesterday. Can you find with work with them, find a focus, ask questions. That's really all there is to it. <laughs> So I'm sorry about the, uh, the the shaky nature of the video. It is rather old now, but hopefully you can see that it, it, it wasn't staged. And it, I, I think, makes uh, a very powerful point that people are incredible learning machines. And if we just engage them in a way that enables them to learn from their own experience rather than us try to impose it from the outside, then they learn actually very, very, very quickly. And they learn in their own way. It's it's unique to them. And we, we saw with Colin from somebody who could barely make contact with the ball, um, to start with, you know, within, within a few minutes, he was hitting it uh, some distance and with a nice thwack behind it. And hopefully you saw that there was a version of those five questions going on there. I was asking him about what his aim was. We were contrasting that with the reality as he was uh, as he was hitting uh, each time. And then the kind of the reflective and the thinking of different options, different ways he could do it, committing to one of those and trying it out was kind of taking place in his own head and very quickly because this was a, a simple physical demonstration. But, you know, the, the idea would hold true if we were coaching somebody to improve sales, say, or something like that. So speaking of which, let's jump uh, a couple of slides. I'm going to increase, increase the, uh, the pace a little bit so that we can finish at the agreed time. So, yeah, so I want you to meet um, Angelina. She might be familiar to some of you, but I know her as a, as a, as a coachee of mine. Um, Angelina is a newly appointed sales manager working in a software company. She, like so many people in management leadership positions, was promoted because she was the, the best performing person. I mean, this is a, a Western disease, isn't it? We promote people to managers by taking them away from what they're good at and giving them a different job instead. Uh, as my friend Andy Hanselman always says, management is the one job you get by being good at something else. And this was the case for Angelina. And she's now struggling to to, to move into that, you know, to sort of move away from direct selling and get used to getting results through other people. So I just want to give you a flavor of how this sort of quick start approach to coaching might might actually work and be useful uh, to somebody in a position like that. So if I could have the next slide, please. Yeah, so the first thing here is aims. The fundamental question that we're trying to understand or address there is what do you want? Uh, you can see that there are some sub questions um, that flow out from that. And if we go on to the next slide, uh, we'll see how Angelina and I had a conversation just exploring that. I'll give you a moment or two just to read through those. Um, and when we adopt a coaching approach using this techniques, this is all around getting some focus then to, to make the connection there on, on where we're trying to get to. You know, what would success look like? What would it be like if this problem was solved? What are you trying to fix or what, what are you trying to develop? Um, depending on, you know, what's sort of voiced at the start of the conversation as the underlying issue or situation. If we could have the next slide, please. Thanks. And from there, then we move on to reality. So if we're if we've gotten some clarity and some focus on where we're trying to get to, the next thing we need to understand is, is what's happening now. What's it like uh, at, at the moment? Um, what's your experience? What, what are you noticing? Again, if we could go on to the next slide, we'll see how Angelina and I thrash that out. I find a good uh, good question to ask at that stage is always what have you what have you tried up to now? Um, often the answer to that is well, actually, I haven't really tried anything, and that can be a great realization for people who um, realize that they themselves have, have, have come unstuck because you know, they haven't they haven't tried anything; they've just been frozen. Next slide, please. Reflection then, as I said, is, is understanding the gap between the two points. And we'll see on the next slide, please, uh, how that uh, might go in a typical conversation. That's on the next slide. Yeah, so sometimes, you know, the, the aim might prove on reflection to have been a bit ambitious and we might need to 
uh, rein that in a little bit. Or the reverse is also true that it's, you know, it's it's a little bit too easy after reflecting on reality that maybe we could be um, extend ourselves a little bit, move ever more outside that kind of comfort zone. If I could have the next slide, please. The options stage is fundamentally around what could you do? You know, what what are the options here? What else could you try? What if you what if you had more time or more budget? It can be quite useful here to sort of play around with the, the parameters of constraints a little bit. If we go to the next slide, please, uh, we'll see how that panned out with Angelina and I. And then, of course, we can go to the fifth and final question or collection of questions on the next slide. And that's the way forward, the, the what will you do piece. And this is really, I always say to people, it's like the action planning bit. You know, everything so far has been uh, going on in our minds. We'll see on the next slide how that works for Angelina and I. Yeah. So this is about turning thought into action, right? You know, everything we've done so far has just been an, an intellectual exercise, but it's really important to, to nudge people and be quite tough-minded sometimes here in, in, in a coaching approach and get people to commit to what are they gonna do and, and, and when are they gonna do it. So um, I hope only that that gives you just some kind of uh, il illustration of how these sort of five simple questions, or even if we just um, expand out a little bit from that, and with only a few minutes spare, and even though we might be doing that um, across a platform like this, we can really have quite powerful coaching conversations that, that draw on some of the key techniques. So.